windows because only the house had been closed. The windows. It was in the 1600s that people began to fit windows of large size in Delft and that they also began to notice the imperfections that glass contained. And there was for um, some years, for some decades in the middle of the 1600s, a fascination with the concept of glass and what it did to light. That painting by Jan Vermeer is one of many, and I'm not going to show any more than just the one, in which he celebrated the effect of glass on light. There's a reflection of the young lady playing one with a spinet above her head. There are other photographs in which reflections and the, the altering of light by glass occurs. Jan Vermeer was, of course, not only a great Flemish painter, but he has an interesting connection with our hero, certainly my hero, Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. Uh, Vermeer appeared on the same page of the baptismal register in Delft as Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. And when Jan Vermeer died, as famous painters often died, without any money and without any recognition, his executor, who was appointed to administer the estate after his death, was none other than, none other than Anthony van Leeuwenhoek. Okay. The little microscopes that Leeuwenhoek made were, of course, simple microscopes in at least two senses. We know, because we work with the damn things, that simple microscopes are simple as opposed to compound. In other words, they contain only one magnifier. The uh, rest of the scientific fraternity wrongly think very often that simple microscopes means simple in the sense that they weren't very complicated. Uh, they were complex to make. They were complicated to handle. But the images they generated, as we shall see, were often of a very high quality. But of course, you didn't need to have anything quite as elaborate as a microscope in order to produce magnified images. This is a 17th century specimen and a glass jar, and it shows perfectly well the effect of curvature, known to the Greeks, of course, the effect of curvature of glass and containing liquids on uh, images, the, the way in which it serves to magnify and distort them. And, of course, you don't have to use anything terribly elaborate in order to produce a magnified image. It is quite interesting to take something simple like, for example, lit by a candle in the corner of my lab, nothing more than a wine glass of water. A wine glass of water can be used, illuminated with a candle, to magnify a slide, and you can generate a satisfactory image. That is an image that shows at the bottom there the two dark pincers, the claws, the mandibles of Benito Americana, the American conqueror. That is just seen through an ordinary glass goblet of water. If you, uh, as you tend to do when there are candles and goblets on tables, if you look at the rounded top of a wine decanter, which is a, an inch, in, inch diameter lens, you can obtain that kind of image of the head of the cockroach, and there you can see quite plainly its eyes, you can see its mandibles, and you can see its, uh, its antennae. I expect there's a long switch on this, isn't there? Oh, yes. There you can see the antennae perfectly plainly. And there again are those jaws and the little pouts with which the unfortunate creature would have guided food into its mouth before I got it. <laughs> but that is the image simply through the stopper on the top of a spirit decanter. The cockroach, in this case, was imaged through a child's marble, now about uh, a centimetre in diameter, and made just of rough soda glass. And that is how our cockroach lived looked through the same round blob of glass on the top of the wine decanter. It is a clearly magnified image, and even though it's a very poor one and a degraded one, it reminds you that dentists don't have to be terribly sophisticated to show you more than the naked eye otherwise will. If you look through nothing more than a tiny bit of glass you can make yourself, that is all you're ever likely to see. The way you make these little bead lenses is very simple. You simply
a glass rod. Try it, please do. A glass rod of centre glass and draw it out in the Bunsen plane, rotating it between your fingers if you do so. We'll pull it out about this far. Remember to remove it from the flame, those of you who haven't done it, before the glass begins to solidify. Then put the glass back into the flame and of course the heat will instantly melt the fine thread. And by running the rod back into the flame you'll produce a tiny glass bead at one end. And if you were to hold it against a section of ZMAs, then that is more or less what you'd see and you'd think to yourself, well, not a very convincing image. But if you are prepared to play with the image and to carefully adjust the focus and to cut down the light source, then even with that, most simple of all tiny beam mm -hmm. magnifiers, you may end up with an image like that. Now that is a hand-cut section of Zia, uh, the magnet. It does nothing terribly clever about the section. It is uh, unstained. It is constrained with a cover slip, though otherwise unmounted. And yet you can see the characteristic Mickey Mouse basket of uncles with the thickened side of vessels quite plainly visible. And I would guess that the smallest cells that you can see there are probably about 35 mm band. So that is made with a little handmade blob of glass, a lens about one and a half to two millimeters in diameter. It's not polished, it hasn't been ground, it hasn't been smooth, it hasn't been treated. All that's happened is that it's been opposed to a hand cut section. And with that, it's nothing there costing more than a dime. With that, you can produce an interesting photomicron. The challenge of uh, photomicrography with Berlin lenses um, is, uh, is one that takes you to strange places. In that photograph, I'm clasping my, my hands with what might look like fervent eagerness, but was in fact cold because the room in which we're standing there is the room of uh, Linnaeus in Uppsala, in Sweden. Linnaeus, of course, who gave us the, uh, the famous Latin name of science, the binomial convention of naming all species of living thing. Uh, Linnaeus's room is unheated in his house, and that was midwinter, and the temperature was 12 degrees below. So we were all feeling pretty chilly at the time. On the other hand, there is a great benefit, because it does mean that everything in his room has been wonderfully well preserved over the centuries. Now, Linnaeus had a microscope, and that is it. A little microscope of the cut variety. The, the case is covered with chagrin. You heard a little about that earlier on today. And uh, sadly, it, it did once have two lenses. Only one of them now remains. And the only lens that 
in uh, in Utrecht, as you'll see. The point of doing these experiments, of course, is to try and tease images out of instruments under difficult circumstances. It's terribly deceptive to take an old microscope, to screw it into a modern illuminator and a modern camera, bang away and say, well, that's what we saw. But of course, very often, they could have seen no such thing. They would have worked, as in that case, with a candle. And there I have a microscope of the kind used by Louis Pasteur when he was working for the Whitbread Brewery in East London. Remarkable how unglamorous it sounds when you redefine history like right that. But it is possible to use nothing but a candle flame and nothing but a microscope of uh, unrefined kind in order to generate an image like that of the foot of a house fly. If you uh, use um, modern lighting conditions, then of course you fill the substage with light and you see an image of that kind. But it's not really fair to, to do that. You have to remember that many of these workers used oil lamps and candles as their limit, and it's only fair to them that we should do the same thing ourselves. Standing in the middle of the collection of microscopes in uh, Utrecht makes one realize the vast diversity of uh, instruments that have remained. And as I think you will know from my previous friendly visits to the micro meetings, it's, it's a great shame that we have honed in so much on the compound microscope, because until not much more than a century ago, it was the simple microscope that was actually making most of the important discoveries. And that wasn't a slip of the tongue. It was as late, I think, as 1856 that um, Darwin was still advising people only to use a simple microscope for high magnification, high resolution microscopy. That's a, a Muschenbroek microscope um, in existence in the Dutch um, collections. Um, the microscope which came in this fitted case comprised of a number of little simple lenses mounted in uh, holders. And the specimen went on the end of this little bracket and was simply opposed to the lens. It is possible to take pictures with those lenses, although they don't look at first sight amenable to that sort of exercise. And that's the sort of thing you can see with a typical lens. That is um, the epidermis and allium of the onion. And uh, that's a perfectly satisfactory view taken with oil lamp as an illuminant and with no substage. But that is the kind of view that you would have seen with a medium power lens. You can see the cell wall is quite plainly, and some details of what lies within will return to onion in a little while because, of course, it does lend itself to be peeled into unicellular lamina very, very easily. of simple microscope, it was certainly much more popular than the kind that uh, Anthony Blayburn made, was the Wilson screw barrel microscope, of which that is an example. Um, it has been believed for many years that you can't see very much with a Wilson screw barrel. That's not true. There is the ivory slider about which we heard this afternoon. There are, as there usually were here, four holes. And in each of those apertures, which it comes to suck, a pair of little metal circuits would hold two slivers of mica against each other. And between the two slivers of mica, the dried specimen was imprisoned. The lens itself uh, was adjusted inside there, of course, the tiny single lens, adjusted with this screw. And there is a larger field lens which magnified the image to provide a virtual image for the observer. The uh, microscope, as you can see from that picture, the microscope barrel was about an inch or so in diameter. And that's what you see with it. Those are yeast cells magnified with a Wilson screw barrel. That is an image that any amateur microscopist could have obtained by popping down, as it were, to his local 
have made in their thousands, they're now worth thousands. But it's strange to think that although they're just curios in uh, a great many glass-fronted cupboards, that they nonetheless generate perfectly satisfactory images. And if you look, you can see um, many of the details in that uh,
cover the sharp point, and on that point you would impale a hatless flea. How do you got people who supposed to catch fleas in themselves and stick them on the pig and watch the little devil suffering in his death agonies as a form of microscopist's revenge? Um, and to stop yourself from pricking yourself accidentally, there was a piece of ivory that was placed onto the pin. I think people often think that the little disc of ivory is just what it is, but in fact the disc of ivory always conceals a very sharp point. And the ivory disc is, is left white on one side, that's the side you can see there, and the other side was always painted black, so that you could lay on it any small object of contrasting colour in order to observe it most easily. And at the other end, you had these interesting little pointed forceps, which were made of sprung steel, and they were held together by their own tensility. But two little knobs enabled you, if you press them, to open the forceps and pop in or flower, whatever else it might be, for observation. Stage forceps are a very useful thing to use, and they can be quite useful even today. And they were, in fact, in production for microscopes in the early years of, the, of this century. So they're not quite as, as ancient as all that. But what it is possible to do is to take those little lenses and to mount them um, in place of the objective lens of a conventional microscope. That is Brown's instrument when it is uh, erected, ready for use. You can see the substage mirror. There is a single condenser lens. Here is the stage, and there are the stage forceps holding, in this case, um, a flower for no power magnification. This is the, uh, the business end of the microscope. There is a contemporaneous slide with a flea mounted in it. There is the, the lens. That would be a lens of medium power, say magnifying about 40 or 50 times. And the image it generates, which we'll see in great detail in a moment, is this. That's the kind of image that you get. That, again, is onion epidermis. And that is one of the specimens in which Robert Brown first um, examined uh, the nucleus and later gave it its name. If you look, you can see quite plainly these nuclei. It's interesting to note that um, I gave a lecture demonstration for the Linnaean Society in London to commemorate the uh, 150th anniversary of the naming of the nucleus earlier this, um, earlier this decade. And 50 years before that, there had been a celebration of the centenary of the naming of the nucleus. And um, Brown's microscope, having been in the possession of the Linnaean Society, of which he was a president for many years, had um, uh, later gone missing and was subsequently returned to the society. It turned up in a house sale, a kind of a garage sale in uh, 1920 and was brought up by a lady called Ida Silver and Miss Silver presented the microscope because she realized who it was from a little note inside to the Linnaean Society and you would think would you not since they were going to celebrate the centenary of the naming of the nucleus by Robert Brown that this microscope would have been a matter of high drama but of course it wasn't as I've said many times in the past People have not, and in many cases still do not, understand the power of the simple microscope. And so when that instrument came back into the society's care, they made no attempt to recreate his discoveries. All they did was to say, the microscope that Robert Brown used has since come back into our possession, but it is difficult to see how he could have made any of his discoveries as it is little more, I quote their exact words, little more than a common dissecting microscope, an instrument 
is the entire field of view minus the cut off at the top of the bottom of the brown microscope. If you were to look at that image, I don't think any of you would automatically assume that it was generated by anything quite so simple. That's a section of aquatic stem that would be very often um, seen under the same circumstances. You can see these stellate pairs, which contain oxalates, of course, and are typical of um, aquatic plants, uh, the vascular bundles, and also, of course, the, the, the delicate array of cell walls. Now, I mean, that is a perfectly satisfactory photomicrograph. If you were asked in a critique of it, you might possibly point out that there does seem to be a certain degree of spherical aberration. You could say, well, the exposure could have been a little bit longer, there's a slightly greenish colour cast, but come along, chaps, if you're going to start making criticism about that, about being of that sort, then it would apply to an awful lot of modern photomicrographs too. That one was made with an instrument that was um, fitted with ground single lenses that were produced about the year 1820. Now, the very important point to bear in mind is that the um, compound microscope was always better understood and better appreciated by people simply because of the fact that it was large and it was glamorous and it was attractive. Now, that may seem a strange thing to say. And it's very tempting to think, well, surely people in science are not so frivolous in their attitudes. They are not so um, easily led astray by glamour and by the status symbol as to be impressed by things like that. But, of course, you can see interesting modern counterparts. One example I used to quote was our modern interest in high fire. We all go to people's homes where they have thousands of bucks worth of high fire gear standing on the shelves, and the noise it produces is appalling because these idiots don't know how to adjust it properly. And it is filled with graphic equalizers, with filters, and with the upper and lower frequency boosts, which A, none of them know how to use, and B, which none of them could hear the difference of, even if they did know how to use it. And they are not there because their ears are unsatisfied by what they have heard. They are there because they impress their friends. And we have a more modern example, and that, of course, is the computer keyboard. When I was little, which is months ago now, I remember perfectly well that typing and the use of a qwerty lay keyboard was a pansy job that you left to women, because it's all that women were really good at. <laughs> and I used to say, when I was a student, I, I, I used to say to my child, well, I mean, computers are going to get smaller. I used an Elliot 803 in the early 60s. I said, computers are going to get smaller, so I'm not going to refine this silly old-fashioned handwriting. I'm going to start typing. I would type my signature on checks if I could get away. Uh, I, I said, I'm going to learn to type. And uh, so I did, in order to be ready for keyboards coming along. And I've always typed. Um, uh, my wife has, uh, for tax deductible purposes, and that's another thing I can't very well say anything but has always been declared as my typist, but I do most of my letters myself. I like to sit and type, but I don't quite see why anybody else should have to do it. One can think of the ideas and get them done quickly. And I prefer to do that. It's more personal, and it uh, communicates more directly with the friend to whom you're writing. But nobody else, but they said, well, fancy you typing your own letters. That's a ridiculous thing. You should have a woman to do it for you. <laughs> but didn't it change when computers came along? As soon as computers came along, and computers were grand and glorious, and covered with gadgetry, and had exactly the right kind of um, macho and complicated and technical sort of gadget-ridden ethos for males, then all of a sudden, typing away on keyboards was perfectly all right to do. And wherever you go now, you see uh, broadening in the waist executives sitting on their melanin laminated desks, bashing away with fingers displayed like, like starfish 
jabbing at buttons, belting up and down, looking with glee at indecipherable gibberish that they, through their own inept programming, have put upon the VDU, and saying how wonderful it is to be able to type. Ten years ago, they would have done that. So let nobody fool any of us that we have things like hi fives or computers because of the fact that we've got to do this, or it's the only way to behave. We do it because it is the fashion. It happens to be trendy, and we like it. And it was exactly the same with the compound microscope. The reason that poor old Robert Brown's microscope was, was consigned almost to the room cupboard when it was restored to the Linnaean Society is simply because it was too small, it was too ordinary, and it was uninspiring. The microscopes of the three previous centuries to where we are now, I mean, from the middle 1600s onwards, that people liked to use were all compound microscopes because they looked good. The serious work was all done with simple microscopes, and nobody gave a sock for those because they looked unexciting. Snobbery is a very powerful motivator, and it worked just as much in microscopy as it did anywhere else. That is the uh, detailed picture. Uh, the other was, of course, a, a montage copy of the image that Robert Brown obtained with his little microscope. And here you can see chromatic aberration. Do not be put off by the notion that chromatic aberration is caused by off-center optics or badly adjusted light path. That's not what chromatic aberration is at all. Chromatic aberration is the generation of spurious colors inside a specimen. In other words, these early observers would note some little structure, like mitochondria within an animal cell, and would notice that they all appear to be lilac. And the point was, were they lilac or weren't they lilac? That was all that mattered. It was a question of whether the color was real or not. It was not a question, and I said this myself um, in, in the days that I wrote on the subject, having a, when I had not done as much uh, practical experimentation as I should have done with these microscopes. I had nobody else had, so I had a slight excuse. But it was not a question that the image was obscured, that the image was lost because of a massive rainbow fringe. And when you see microscope images where on the one side there is a fringe of blue and on the other side a fringe of yellow and they say that's chromatic aberration. Of course it is, and that's what we call a cocker. They haven't adjusted the instrument properly. What really happens, and this is the brown microscope correctly adjusted, but what really happens is that you tend to actually find that certain structures look colored when they aren't. And yet, the detail within the structure is perfectly clear. That is a low power lens of Robert Brown's microscope. And if you look at this little cell, you can see very plainly the cell wall. You can make up the nucleus. You can see the nucleus just within it. And you can also see dotted around mitochondria. And they are perfectly plainly visible. It is a, an extraordinarily gratifying image. Now this is a biconvex lens made by gravity. The lens itself would magnify, I suppose, about times 85. It would have a focal length of about two and a half to three millimeters. It would be about uh, three millimeters in diameter and a little less than two millimeters thick and would simply be a conventional tiny lens. It was made by grinding, grinding from a glass bead. The, the bead was first blown, then the two sides were ground. The same microscope will give you a beautiful image using darkroom. I don't doubt that, although because these uh, instruments were simple, they were no more special to their users than something like a pair of scissors is to you. I mean, we're always told, aren't we, that computers can do things that humans can't, and in that way we imbue them with some sort of supernatural ability. Well, of course, so can a thumbtack, so can uh, uh, a real sticky tape, so can a dustbin. There are many things. Uh, well, a butterfly can do plenty of things that human beings can't do. There's nothing particularly miraculous about that. 
so very little was ever said about the way in which those microscopes were used. But the um, concave lens of those early botanical microscopes, if adjusted to one side and then focused, particularly using sunlight, which would have been very available, could give you uh, a very interesting dark ground effect. Sunlight, of course, causes too many diffraction fringes to give you a clear image. But uh, that is uh, northern skylight put onto the same specimen as we saw just now and uh, gives a graphic demonstration of cytological detail. Again, within each of the um, uh, cells, you can see very plainly the cell wall and the nucleus. And of course, the little mitochondria show up much better um, by the use of dark gun microscopy. Glad to see it coming up this afternoon with those interesting paper sections. Dark gun microscopy is a much underrated form of the equation. That is now using one of the higher power lenses of uh, the brown microscope. It is uh, um, important that I mention that in, in recreating many of these experiments, I've always had as a principle that you must not unwittingly fool yourself by introducing artifacts that were not available at the time. And so this particular example, for instance, has not been uh, uh, mounted and uh, stained or fixed or anything as artificial as that. It was done in the way in which Robert Brown would have done it. The thin layer was peeled away from an onion and smeared onto a piece of mica and then just moistened with the breath, nothing else, and observed direct. But that is a, an attractive portrayal in the middle there of a cell with its nucleus. And you can see the nucleus is rather beautifully displayed. Um, there is the, the nucleus itself, and that's more rounded area there is the nucleus. And of course the cell wall itself is, uh, is very well portrayed. You can see pity in the cell wall. Now the important thing about that picture is that if I had simply put it out and said that I wanted to show you something about uh, the cytology of the allium, Nobody in the audience would say, aha, that looks to me as though it was done by a 150-year-old simple microscope that you could have produced on your kitchen table. But it was. Robert Brown uh, also observed cytological uh, streaming. It's a shame, really, that we can't show this in, in video. Um, he uh, used as one of his test objects these staminal hairs of uh, Pelliscaccio Viginiana. Uh, these staminal hairs are interesting because um, they, uh, I'm sure many of you grow this plant yourselves, you know there are three largish uh, purple petals, a bunch of yellowish stamens, and the stamens are padded out. It looks, if you'll forgive the indiscretion, rather like a pubic head, pad out in between the stamens. And in fact, if you pick out one of the pubic hairs from the flower and look at it with the naked eye, you can see the individual cells quite plainly. I think we often tend to forget that many microscopic structures are amenable to naked eye observation. And if you pluck one of these little hairs from the flower of uh, Travis Campion and look at it very, very carefully, you can see the transverse center and make out individual cells with the naked eye. Um, and what Brown noticed, and this is a, a, a picture taken with his reading pilot, is that the way the nucleus was suspended was a little bit like spiral out, with cytoplasmic strands, and little dots could be seen to be moving in both directions along the same strand, looking under dark ground for all the world like traffic on a highway seen from a plane. And Brown described that graphically and uh, with great uh, accuracy. Uh, he later described it in the giant cells of uh, the stonework uh, Chara and uh, Nitella. But it was in Fadiscantia that he first uh, made the observation.
they might possibly be living molecules, active molecules. That all this uh, um, frantic, jiggling movement that you can see represented the course of life going on within the pollen grain. And being a sensible chap, he didn't publish the view at all, but he looked at other particles. He looked at particles of uh, Indian ink and coal dust and saw the same effect. He also, most interestingly, he looked at liquid vesicles trapped within amber and resin, fossil resins, and could see little parts inside those jiggling about too. And therefore, he said, anybody who tries to suggest that they are biological molecules is clearly talking not through his mouth. So that uh, Brown was able to see much smaller details than anybody has given him credence for. The Victorians, with their uh, brass compound microscopes, weren't really looking at microscopic objects at all. They were looking at macroscopic objects, just as Robert Hooke was doing in the 1660s. Do bear in mind that uh, my thesis has always been that, that Robert Hooke was magnifying conventional structures in order to make them look big and interesting. Anthony with labor book, on the other hand, was looking at things which we did not know existed. Leyland Hooke was looking at microscopic entities. Robert Hooke was looking at conventional entities macroscopically. The highest magnification of anything, apart from the drawing of the cork, which must be magnified about 120 times in micrographia, is typically about times 12, times 20, times 25. And the kind of things that all the time that the uh, simple microscope was being used for real research was things like hummingbird feathers, um, that uh, neat little array was made in the middle of the 1800s and was typical of the kind of thing that people liked to study with those Victorian microscopes. Another example, this time mounted in Balsam, uh, was an insect. But it is the whole insect that was interesting. And of course, that spans 200 years of microscopical history. Because this insect is inspiring because of its wholeness. It is, it is a, a, a macro photograph that we're looking at here. A photo macrograph, not a photo micrograph. Um, and it was the macroscopic appearance, just like the two most popular plates in Robert Hooke's micrographia of 1665, which were, of course, a flea and a louse, both conventional and well-known objects, but made bigger. So from the amateur enthusiast's point of view, the compound microscope of the middle 1800s was being used for exactly the same thing as the compound microscope of the 1600s. These are uh, uh, luminescent phosphorescent crystals from uh, a tropical beetle. Again, uh, uh, a popular sort of a collector's item. I mean, many of these Victorians didn't make slides. They just collected them, a bit like games cards for your computer. Just as many of the Victorians didn't do much microscopy, they bought the slides and put the computer, <laughs> sorry about that, yeah. and put the microscope to the, the slide purely in order to demonstrate it. The same thing happens nowadays. Um, uh, domestic microcomputers in the homes of uh, Americans and, and Britons are very common. I doubt whether more than 0.1% of them have ever been programmed by their owners. People buy software, and unless you're going to program it, you don't really need a computer.
colors themselves are spirit. But it doesn't stop you from appreciating the delicate portrayal of a small structure. And that, under a labor book type lens, not in fact a lens made by labor, but one exactly similar, is the uh, fresh and unmounted cell of a lens. The um, interesting thing about that is that you can now see quite plainly mitochondria visible. Those are two or so mu in that. Those particles there will be just about exactly two mu in that. There, of course, is the nucleus and the nucleus within and the pit itself wall around the outside. Horace Dorr, who died a couple of years ago, will be known to some of you. Um, he used to make um, mirrors for Patrick Moore, the British astronomer, and uh, I have a couple of his lenses and some of the uh, pictures he took. Horace was an interesting man. He he was the first. He was with the first group ever to go into the Pinamunda V2 rocket establishment at the end of the Second World War. And um, shortly before he took off, he had a memo saying to him that no cameras were to be taken on this trip. He thought, damn, my dad, they said that. I almost forgot my camera. <laughs> So he dashed into the house, got his small 35mm camera, and took it with him in his lunchbox. And when he arrived, first, a terribly funny story, the first thing that the uh, organizing official said when he arrived was, damn, we haven't got any cameras ourselves. How very annoying. So Horace, of course, quietly said, what a terrible shame it was. And whilst it all went off, he went round and took all the pictures. And he gave me some of them since they've never been published. Uh, that they are the, the first photographs ever taken in the um, rocket sites of uh, Hitler's Germany at the very end of World War II. He once showed me photographs of his first wife, um, a stunningly beautiful and intelligent woman, um, in three-dimensional color pictures that he took in the early 1930s with camera he built and designed himself. And Horace gave me a tiny single lens microscope with the lens ground from Spinel and magnified about 395 times. And that is a picture of the unmounted uh, onion endodermis, and you see it through that lens. Here, of course, there's no point in pointing out the entire cell wall because the magnification is too great. All you can see is a bit of the cell wall. And here are two adjacent nuclei. And here are the two mu diameter particles. Those are, that is a particle the size of a staphylococcus. And there it is, handsomely portrayed by a lens which any of you, if you were to take up after lens grinding, could make in the evening. Just to end, a couple of pretty views. That is a section of Osmunda, the royal firm, Osmunda. It was staying, I, I cut that as a kid, I think it was staying in Crystal Violet, as far as I remember. But here you can see the xylem vessels. And just look at the, the middle lamella, how beautifully, delicately that is portrayed. That is a photograph taken with a single lens microscope. That is with uh, one of the lenses from Robert Brown's instrument, a medium power lens, but a starch grate in the cells on the right. And uh, all of the cytoplasmic details that you need to see are visible with that tiny magnifier. So there we are, we've come full circle. We're back with the cockroach and the rounds top of the decanter. There are occasions when I see the image of the sun projected on a fawn leaf in the garden where a drop of dew has focused the light rays into a spot. There are times when one sees the crescent moon projected through uh, the leaves on a bright night in the middle of winter where the moon is focused on the snow like a viewing screen. There are many occasions when one realizes how you don't have to go into an optical workshop to find a magnifier. We began this evening with a wine glass of water, a goblet of water, showed how that magnified chimney 
the Greek philosopher wrote about that. There's nothing new in it. We started and ended with the inch and a half diameter knob on the top of the decanter of wine. Nothing better than that to stimulate thought. We have seen a number of images tonight produced by single lenses, one of them a melted lens, most of them ground lenses, and I've mentioned how some of you might be inclined to try some for yourselves. There are just two points I'd like to leave with you because I find this the most exciting area in which to work. One of them is that most of the images that we've seen this evening compare very favorably with the sort of images that our colleagues present to us today. And that secondly, they're all produced with nothing more complicated than a single bead of glass. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank Brian for his evening with us. I don't think I know of anyone that would be willing or able to uh, offer this kind of an evening to anyone to get away with it. I know if I did it, uh, it would be like uh, holding a party and nobody came. It would be a terrible thing. <coughs> Brian has the nerve to do this. He tries to work. So he does a beautiful job of it. And uh, this is the second time he's done it before. And, uh, we'll try to introduce it. And we'll do it many more times in the future. He doesn't do it, but he shows us uh, as video. Uh, I hope that he'll do it many times. I guess, well, I mean, there are bits of technology that people that use the pose. I can't do that. Some of it's real, like that. Right. Well, thank you very much, Brian. Thank you. He has offered to... Uh, no, he hasn't. He's been asked like, a few questions. He hasn't offered to do any such thing. He has agreed. Yes. All right. To comply with the request for questions and discussions. Would it be uh, still more nearly accurate representation of what the lens Well, I would say no, because there's usually an eye lens in the way when you look at the image you get. So let's let's put the eye lens in once we've printed our micrograph and are looking at the result. I don't think that's optically No, it's the best answer I could come up with on the spur of the moment. But, 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 but the point is that, that all I'm trying to say is when you look at the resulting micrograph, do not imagine there is no um, I there, there is, there is yours. And what I am really doing is to take the object, put it through the lens and as it were inertially record it, and then say to you, 3,000 miles away, look at that. And, and so that, as it were, holds the image generated by the lens in time and in space for you then to look at it. So that in one respect, photography enables you to have the same view that I get or anybody else gets down the, uh, uh, down the lens. So, I mean, so, so there's only one lens worth between your retina and his image. So I think it's quite bad. Would you take that point? Let's, let's, let's be a little bit. Sure. <laughs> oh, fine. Thanks very much. Yes, whiskey sour. Uh, Any other questions? The little man It is, um, it, right, but, but, but Horace always said it was its um, chromatic dispersion that he liked, rather than the refractive index or so. Yes, because of course it tended to minimize chromatism. to um, uh, a tendency to um, limit the spectral rank and therefore indeed, I mean, 
Brian again. I don't know anybody who could keep so many of us so long away from.